Yeah, I think, um, again, at this stage, we're going to offer him a CRTD, but um, there's no studies to show that patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, low EF, benefit from ICD for primary prevention. Yeah, and that was shown in the Danish studies, too. Yeah, still, it, but it made it into the guidelines, so we just follow the guidelines. I agree with you. <coughs> okay, pardon my voice, guys. It's getting worse and worse. So I'm going <coughs> to... I already had one coffee, so it's not helping. <coughs> so we're going to go step-by-step -step approach for left bundle ranch area pacing. I have no disclosures. <coughs> so we're going to talk about step-by-step -step approach to left bundle ranch area pacing, and then <coughs> I'll try to give some tips and tricks for successful implant. And if time allows, I'll show some cases. So this um, slide, Parikh already showed it to us. So basically, the tools available at this stage, you have a C315 his sheath and a 3830 pacing lead. <coughs> the new sheath, which is available, I think, for the last, <coughs> since last um, May, I believe, at, in US, is a deflectable his sheath, and it definitely has improved the success rates for left bundle branch area pacing implants, especially in patients with enlarged hearts. <coughs> I showed this slide in my first talk. So for the his bundle pacing, you're targeting this narrow, precise area, whereas for left bundle branch area pacing, you have <coughs> a wider landing zone, you can either try slightly distal to the hills, or you can come all the way up to mid-septum. Hence, I, I feel like it's technically easier, and you have higher success rates with the left bundle branch area pacing. <coughs> so how do we do it? Again, uh, we started doing left bundle branch area pacing since uh, Feb 2019. So over the past one year, we have implanted about 150 left bundle branch area pacing leads. We have completely switched over from his to left bundle branch area pacing. And I think our success rates are about 88 to 90% uh, overall success rates. And so far, we've not had any major complications, like late perforations. We did have four or five transeptal perforations during the procedure, but we recognize that we moved the lead to a different spot. Again, when doing the case earlier, there was a concern not to give more turns. There was a concern about LV septal perforation. So what, the question is, what are the consequences of LV septal perforation? Again, so far we had only about five cases where we had transeptal perforation. We've not had any issues. Again, if you think about it, for atrial fibrillation ablation, we put two transeptal sheets, like Agilus 12 French sheets across, and then pull it out, leaving behind like three to five millimeter gap without any issues, right? We put a cryo sheet 16 French across. We don't think about it. This is a small four French lead with a very small diameter at the tip. So that too in the muscular septum, if you go through and through and come back, I feel like it should just close out. And the pressures on the left side are higher than the right side, so it's unlikely to cause um, any right to left shunts. So the first step uh, in left bundle branch area pacing, first thing is to do is to locate the distal his. Cine shot and save it for reference, as we did in the case this morning. Sometimes you might not be able to map the his. In those cases, I usually go by the tricuspid annular signal, or if they have prosthetic valves, that serves as a good reference. Once you have that spot, advance the sheath. Just gently clock it advance the sheet about one to two centimeters distal to the distal his. At this spot, pace map. The ideal site should have two of these things. Actually, it can be either of them. So you can see a W pattern in V1 with a hump on the later half, preferably. This is the pattern which was described by the Chinese folks. And in our experience, we see that maybe 50 to 60% of the time. So you don't see it all the time. What we go by is the inferior lead and the AVR avial discordance. So what it means is we typically like doing <coughs> with 12 leads on the pruca, and we color code AVR avial so that in a live situation, you can easily 
identify AVR, AVL discordance. AVR is typically negative, AVL is positive. And lead two is typically taller than lead three. If you think about it, if a PVC comes in from a parahesian focus, that's the morphology you get it. So that's what we are trying to look at, which kind of gives us an idea that we are on the septum. Once you identify that morphology, typically I rotate it once or twice just to get a bite into the tissue. And then, I don't know why it's cutting off. But, um, <coughs> once you have that, note the pacing impedance and the QRS morphology. So you get a baseline pacing impedance and also you make sure that the QRS morphology is consistent with your parahesian or septal morphology, meaning sometimes if you're rotating it once, it can jump up into the outflow track, and you might end up with the outflow track morphology, and you don't want to miss it. <coughs> so this is the ideal site for fixation. So as I mentioned, this is a tool leads. We use AVR, AVL color-coded. We would like putting the V1 all the way at the bottom, just for the sake of ease, because you are close to the left bundle electrograms. So you can see the V1 has just QS without any notch, but you have AVR, AVL discordance, and lead two is taller than lead three. There is a discordance, inferior lead and AVR, AVL discordance. The next, once you have the ideal site, the most, second most important point is the ideal sheath position. So what's the difference between his bundle pacing and left bundle branch area pacing? So the his bundle pacing, when, once you get the sheath at the his area, the septal curve makes it look, in the RAO, it looks like it's going towards like a 12 o'clock position, 12 to 1 o'clock position, okay? Whereas the left bundle lead should face like 2 o'clock. If you think this is like a clock face, it should face about 2 o'clock. That tells you if you think about the septum in this direction, you have to be perpendicular to the septum, okay? Again, in the beginning when you're trying to do the left bundle branch area pacing cases, I would urge you to go to the LAO, make sure you're on the septum, confirm it before screwing it in. Okay. <coughs> Once you're at this position, what typically happens is you need to counter the sheath. Sometimes it's 45 degrees, sometimes it's more than that, to try to orient the sheath perpendicular to the septum. In some cases, you might not even need to counter. Just the position itself keeps you <coughs> very perpendicular to the septum. So once you have the torque, <coughs> gently advance the sheath so that it's averting the septum. If you have somebody to hold the sheath in place, that's great. You can also do it single-handedly, but it's better if you have somebody holding the sheath, maintaining that counter torque. Once you have that, the next step is to rotate four to five times rapidly under fluoro to assess the depth of the lead into the septum. And you know, with the his bundle leads, we used to do single hand technique, but with the left bundle, I typically prefer two hand rolling technique. And you can feel the difference. As you keep rolling, you can feel that the lead is going into the septum. Once you have that four to five turns, then hook it up unipolar tip and then check the lead parameters. Pay particular attention to the impedances. The impedance gradually trends up as the screw starts going into the septum. So today we, ha we started off at 1,000. It gradually went up to 1,100, 1,300, 1,400s. And then it started to come down. It came down to like 1,300s. Once it starts to come down, <coughs> we know that we are coming close to the left side of the septum. Usually it can fall by up to 100 ohms. If it suddenly drops by more than 300 ohms, typically, that tells you that you're through and through. Next thing, <coughs> you also pay attention to the QRS duration and the morphology in V1. Try to look for the left bundle potential. Give. So, First, uh, once you give the four turns, you basically look at the impedance, the morphology, look for any left bundle potential, um, and then look for the LVAT. And then the R waves and threshold, I usually check once you have a good morphology. 
So <coughs> once uh, after that, if you don't have a QR or a RSR prime pattern, you can rotate further. After the first the four to five turns, and the next should be like one or two turns at a time. So keep rotating one or two times at a time until you get that QR pattern. Once you get a QR or a RSR prime pattern, I usually stop rotating it, unless irrespective of whether you get a left bundle mesh potential or not. Sometimes you can see backspin or buckling in the septum, like we saw this morning, which can indicate fibrous septum. So once you get the QR pattern, you can do a septogram, we call it septogram. Basically you inject the sheath, you inject the contrast one to two cc's through the sheath in the LAO to look at how deep the lead is in the septum. So typically the helix measures 1.8 millimeters. Tip electrode to the beginning of the ring electrode is nine millimeters and the ring electrode measures about 3.8 millimeters. Once left bundle pacing is confirmed, split the sheath and split the elevation. Anyways, uh, that was to show how deep the lead was in the septum. So you can see clearly the septum delineating the, I'm sorry, the contrast delineating the septal wall, and you can see how deep the lead is in the septum. <coughs> so there's some of the tips and tricks which uh, will help in successful left bundle branch area pacing. I think it's very important to have clean gloves bloody or sticky gloves, especially after injecting contrast, you might not get that same feeling. So whenever you're trying to <coughs> screw in the lead, it's better to either clean your gloves or switch to a new pair of gloves. This is a video of two-hand technique. You can see somebody is holding the sheath counterclockwise, maintaining that counterclockwise stance, torque, and I'm rotating the lead rapidly giving four to five turns under fluoroscopy. This is in the beginning. Okay. <coughs> so what will you do if the lead buckles or backspins? So if the lead buckles at a higher spot, you can try to go down on the septum. So this is one example of how it looks like when the lead buckles. And actually we saw this during the morning case too. So this lead won't go in because, uh, probably because of the fibrous septum. So when this happens, you can reposition the lead. So before repositioning the lead, as Parikh mentioned during the previous talk, it's always important to take the lead out completely and clear off all the tissue. And this is the largest chunk I've come across so far. Nothing like this. So we're Dr. <coughs> Pandrang Igor. I'm not sure what exactly this was, but <laughs> if it was a conduction system tissue or track as well. The third tip is recognize when to give more turns. So the LVAT can actually guide you sometimes. So this is the case at five volts. You can see we had a nice, if you look at V1, we had a nice already RSR prime pattern. And at five volts, the LVAT was 65. The LVAT, LVAT is measured at from the stem to the peak of R in V5 or V6. Anything below 80 is okay. So in this case, we had 65 at five volts. And then when we paste that one volt, you can see the clearly the change in morphology. The stim to QRS was longer and the LVAT was ni 93. So that tells us that you're close. At higher output, you're able to get into the left bundle branch area, but at lower output, you're not getting into that area. So what we did in this case, this guy's septum was a little thick, so I, ha I gave one complete turn, but 
if I see this in a septum where you're e easily able to advance the lead, I would have given only a half a turn. So after one turn, we rechecked. Again, at five volts, the LVAT was 65. And at one volt, now the LVAT became 65. So you need to show short and constant LVAT at higher and lower output. Mm -hmm. That's one of the criteria for um, to say that we are capturing the left bundle branch area. And then you also need to recognize when to stop rotating the lead. So this was a case. Uh, you can see a small left bundle branch potential. I was craving for a larger left bundle branch potential. I gave one more turn. And then you can see there was a clear polarity reversal. So that tells you that you're through and through. For us, all comers get left bundle. Everybody's getting left bundle. <laughs> you know, even for his bundle pacing cases, we were, we were doing his bundle cases for patients with six, sin six sinus syndrome. You know, for everybody used to get a conduction system pacing. Yeah, I know, I've heard. It's not just not patients with AV block or infrahysian block. Yes, I do. Again, people might <coughs> not agree, but I do. Because we, we were uh, putting his bundle leads from 2014 through 2019. We have about 300 his bundle pacing lead implants. We're going to be presenting the data at HRS in May. Our own experience with the his bundle, uh, we've had issues with high thresholds, lead revisions. And since switching back, switching over from his bundle to left bundle in the last one year, we've done 150 left bundle branch area pacing leads. So Not even a single <laughs> patient has threshold more than 1.25 at this stage. No major complications, no lead revisions. So why would I not prefer a left bundle? So that's, that's again, that's what we've been doing it. But again, if you ask Parikh or Vijay Raman, they say that you have to map for his, <laughs> look for the capture threshold. If it's high, then go to the left bundle. But again, we have cases where patients with his bundle, probably I'll show it later today, Capture threshold was 0.5 at one. At implant, we took it for his bundle. Six months later, the capture threshold was six or five. How do you explain that? So there is this unpredictable delayed rise in thresholds with the his bundle leads. If somebody can tell me, okay, which patient will have higher thresholds six months down the road, that would be awesome, but we don't know the predictors yet. So again, in this case, um, you can clearly see the impedance went from about 700 to 320 ohms, and you can see the polarity reversal, suggesting that the lead went through and through. So one suggestion at this point, so once it goes through and through, if you pull back slightly, you might get your QR or RSR prime pattern back. Thresholds might be good, but I think it's best to take out the lead and go to a different spot. Again, this didn't happen to me. I <coughs> learned left bundle branch area pacing from Dr. Vijay Raman. He had a case where he left it pulling after pulling back, but the next day the pacing you lead dislodged. You Basically, you're creating a hole, and then it can easily come off. So it's always better if you're through and through, pull it out completely, go to a different spot. <coughs> so this is, a, this is what you're looking at. So this is the initial pacing site. You had a W pattern in V1. You had AVR, AVL discordance. We gave a few turns, and you can see already how the QRS starts changing. You start to see this delta wave. And when I see that, you know that you're getting closer. You just need the depth. And you can see the notch moving from the descending limb all the way to the nadir. And after a few more turns, you get a QR pattern with a QRS duration of 115 milliseconds. So what are the criteria for left bundle branch area? <laughs> so these are the criteria set forth by Wong, Dr. Wong and Dr. Vijay Raman in the heart rhythm paper. Again, none of these criteria have been validated. So far, this is what we have, so we are going by this criteria. So you look for paced morphology of right bundle branch block pattern. You look for left bundle branch potentials. You look at stim to LVAT times. You look at selective and non-selective left bundle branch pacing configurations. 
and you look for evidence for direct left bundle branch capture. So let's take a look at these. <coughs> Yeah, so at least in our series, we had left bundle branch potential in about 60% of the patients. Not everybody has left bundle branch potential. Dr. Wong recently mentioned they had 98% of the time they had left bundle branch potentials. You know, once we have the QR with a QR duration of 110 milliseconds, it's a risk benefit. You know, you give one more turn, you might go through and through and you might lose that position. So I don't. I don't think there is any data to support that you need to have a left bundle potential to say that you have left bundle branch area capture. So even without l getting the left bundle branch potential, you still might capture the left bundle branch area. I'll show some of the things. Yeah, I'll show some examples where we have retrograde left bundle potentials. But <coughs> the, uh, the point uh, is if you have a baseline left bundle branch block and if you have a pacing lead at the left bundle branch area, you won't be seeing left bundle potentials because you're blocking in the left bundle. But sometimes the impulse can go down the right bundle, transeptal, and come up retrograde, and you can have retrograde left bundle potentials. I'll show some of the examples like that. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the first criteria looking for paced morphology of right bundle branch pattern. You either go by QR or RSR prime pattern. So you here you can see nice RSR prime pattern with a stim to QRS latency of about 28 milliseconds. And also you can notice the local electrograms. There is a split discrete electrogram from the stim. Again, suggest you have selective capture. The second one is to demonstrate presence of left bundle branch potentials. Here are the two examples. You can see left bundle branch potentials. Here it's kind of more inverted, but here you can see a high frequency left bundle branch potential. <coughs> this was a different case. You can actually see a left bundle branch injury current, which we don't often see, it, but sometimes you can see it. And what's interesting is this patient had a right-sided PVC and note what we found. So you can see, you can demonstrate the anti-grade left bundle potential and also retrograde left bundle potential in a patient if they have a right-sided PVC. <coughs> Third criteria is looking at the LVATs. We are already, I've already shown a slide on this. So always demonstrate that the LVAT is short and constant at high and low output. The fourth criteria is demonstrating non-selective to selective left bundle pacing. I think this is very difficult to demonstrate in most of the cases, unlike his bundle pacing, where you can clearly demonstrate non-selective to selective. It is very difficult in left bundle branch area pacing because if you think about where the lead is, it's surrounded by dense myocardial tissue. So majority of the time, you're going to have some septal myocardial activation when you're pacing the left bundle branch area. So this is one example where you can see non-selective to selective during bipolar pacing. So during bipolar pacing, you can see a QS pattern. It changes to QR, and you can see the local split in the electrogram and there's a stim to QRS latency. So here we demonstrate a non-selective to selective during bipolar pacing. This is an example. This is what is typically noted if you see a non-selective to selective left bundle branch morphology during unipolar pacing. So now I'm pacing unipolar tip. So I'm just capturing the left bundle branch area and the surrounding myocardium. So at two volts, you can see the morphology is more like a QR pattern. And if you see V4, V5, Z, V6, there is no stim to QRS latency, and you see the local electrogram, there's no discrete local electrogram. As we came down on the output from 2 to 1.5 to 1, 
all the way down to point three, you can see there is a discrete electrogram. There is a stim to QRS latency. And this, case, this demonstrates transition from non-selective left bundle to selective left bundle. So most of the time, so this is seen in about 15 to 20% of the time. And whenever we saw this phenomena, it's usually at very low capture thresholds, close to the capture threshold of the left bundle branch facing lead. So how can we, you know, to get a selective left bundle branch pacing and program it on the device, it might be impossible. Right, so because usually the non-selective to selective is usually at a very low capture threshold. So most of the patients end up having non-selective left bundle branch pacing. So this is one way we can show evidence for direct left bundle branch capture. You can measure V at times. So this is a patient who got a left bundle branch area pacing lead. We first paced from the unipolar ring. So the ring captures the RV septum, and you can see the white QRS morphology. And you can see the retrograde eight times. And then you do unipolar tip pacing. You can see RSR prime. So no, you know you are capturing the left bundle branch area. And the V8 times were shorter. This is similar to your parahesian pacing. So you can do ring pacing and tip pacing. Sometimes helps in differentiating whether you're capturing the left bundle branch area or not. You can demonstrate the same thing on the analyzer. So this is on the top, you can see the VA times measured from the surface QRS to the atrial electrogram. When we were pacing the ring, was 220 milliseconds. And when we were pacing the tip, it was 160 milliseconds. Again, it makes sense. When you're pacing the ring, you're not capturing the conduction system. It has to come all the way down and then go up through the conduction system up to the A. So that's why your VA times are longer. Whereas when your lead tip is at the left bundle branch area, you're capturing the left bundle branch, and then you can readily go up to A. So the VA times will be shorter. Again, similar to your parahesian pacing. So again, to summarize what we talked about, the step-by-step -step approach, first and foremost, try to identify the distal his marked by an asterisk. So you get distal his bundle potential. There's no A, again, tells you you're distal. Once you have that, go about one and a half to two centimeters distal. In some cases where you don't, you cannot identify the his bundle potential, or if you have a prosthetic valve, you can just go take, use that as a reference and go two centimeters distal to it. Once you have that pace map, you're looking for this pattern. You're looking for inferior lead discordance and AVR, AVL discordance. So this is the ideal site. Screw it in. As you screw in, after initial few turns, you can start to see delta wave in V5, V6 here. We get a few more turns at this point. And now you can see the pace morphology is right bundle branch block. The V1 is at the bottom. This is your V1. So unipolar tip. Once you see this RSR prime pattern, we stop at this point. We don't go for left bundle branch potential. So out of those five criteria, we always try to get right bundle branch morphology, and we always check LVAT times, stim to LVAT times. Those are the two main big things. If they have retrograde conduction, we look for VA times. So those are the three things. And if we get a left bundle branch potential, that's a bonus. Once you get the tip, you can also pace ring. This is the ring pacing you can see the widening of the QRS. These are the QRS durations. I don't know if you guys can see. Initially, it was 144, narrowed it to 125. With left bundle branch area pacing, it was 114, and the ring was 136. Once you have ring capture, again, it tells you that the ring is close to the septum or in the septum. That automatically should tell you that at least 1.1 centimeter of the lead is in the septum. And then, once you have that, Look for left bundle branch potentials. Look for stim to peak of V5, V6, LVAT times at five volts, one volt. And then try to demonstrate non-selective to selective. Here you can see a QR pattern. Look at the local electrogram, how it splits, non-selective to selective with latency when you have selective. So this is 
the basic um, approach to left bundle branch area pacing. <coughs> so again, as I mentioned, all these criteria which we have been using are not validated. This is a very elegant paper from the Polish folks, recently published, I think it's out in JCE now, where they used programmed deep extra stem, programmed extra stem to differentiate whether you have a left bundle branch area capture or not. So this is a concept taking, taking into account that you have differential effective refractory periods of the septal myocardium and the left bundle branch area. So if you think about it, when you pace the left bundle branch area, since you have a lot of myocardial tissue around, predominantly you're going to be getting non-selective left bundle branch area pacing. But there is also some, uh, a paper from Netherlands group where they showed that LV septal pacing is good enough. So when we are trying to do conduction system pacing, or we, we really like to know, we really like to differentiate whether it's LV septal pacing versus left bundle branch area pacing. So this maneuver actually can be very helpful, and we started doing this maneuver to differentiate whether we have left bundle branch area pacing or not. So how do we do it? So just pay attention on the left side. So you have, <coughs> so you can do extra stim by two ways. You can do a basic dry frame at 600 milliseconds, and then do a, give an extra stim at a coupling interval of 400, and then decrement by 10 milliseconds, 400, 390, 380. Or you can do an extra stim during sinus rhythm. So on the left side, you can see an example of programmed extra stim. So just pay attention to V1. So V1, during the drivetrain, you can see a QR pattern, right? So at this point, you don't know, am I capturing just the LV septum? Am I capturing the LV septum plus septal myocardium? Or is it pure left bundle branch area pacing? So when you do the program stim here with the basic drivetrain, and when they gave the extra stim, note what happened with the extra stim. The QR's morphology completely changed. It became wide. You lost the right bundle branch morphology in V1, and it's wider than your paced morphology. So what happened here is the effective period, refractory period of the left bundle branch was reached, and the patient just had myocardial capture. So now this, they call it as myocardial response. When you see this, you know that your drive train was both a mixture of septal myocardial capture plus left bundle branch area. Because now you've shown by this example that the ERP of the left bundle is longer and the ERP of the septal myocardium is shorter. Okay, this is one way, actually a very elegant way to prove that we are capturing the left bundle branch area. On the right side, you have another example. Here they are giving extra stim during sinus rhythm. Okay, so again pay attention to V1. So this is an extra stim. Sinus, two sinus beats, and then you gave an extra stim, say, at 350 milliseconds. With the extra stim, you can see the morphology is QR in V1. Right? You have a nice right bundle branch pattern, nice QR. When they decremented by 10 milliseconds from 350 to 340, now see what happened. It became RSR, and you have stim to QRS latency. So now you're showing you change from non-selective left bundle to selective left bundle, okay? So they call this selective left bundle response. So what they found that in their series, 80% of the patients, they demonstrated either myocardial or left bundle response, which confirmed left bundle branch area capture. What was interesting in their paper was some of the patients, they didn't find any left bundle branch potential but they were able to still demonstrate left bundle branch area capture based on the program stem. So again, that tells you that you don't necessarily need to have left bundle branch potential to demonstrate left bundle branch capture. Do you have time for a couple, just a couple cases? Okay. <coughs> yeah. I just have a few more slides. <coughs> so <coughs> this was a case where we tried the fixed curve sheet. Patient had AFib. And you can see we mark the his position. The asterisk points towards the his. And then every time we advance the sheet, the sheet 
never would come down. It would actually try to go up. And when we pace here, look at the morphology now. So if you just pay attention to V1, sometimes you can get, sometimes you can see a W pattern even in the outflow track. So you might think, oh, W pattern, it's great. You can screw it in. I have seen cases with outflow track morphology with a W pattern in V1. So the W pattern in V1 is not very specific for that location. So here you can see two and three are positive, AVR, AVL is negative. So I know I'm in the outflow track, so we didn't take this position. But every time I tried advancing the sheath, it won't go down. So you can see here the asterisk is the his, and this dotted line is the position of the sheath. I wanted to get the sheath lower, but I couldn't get it. So in this case, we switched to Medtronic 304 deflectable, the new sheath, and you can see how low we were able to get. This was a his, and we were able to get lower and pacing revealed the AVR, AVL discordance and lead to taller than lead three and screwing in the lead at this point resulted in a good right bundle branch morphology with a QR duration less than 120 milliseconds. <coughs> this was another interesting case. Patient with complete heart block received a, I'm sorry, complete heart block post aortic valve replacement. So he presented for a pacemaker. So as we talked about the anatomy this morning, typically the his is close to the right cusp, non-coronary cusp. So I would have expected, we did try here in this location, but it was very fibrous. So we kept going down and finally ended up at this spot, which you can see it's actually pretty low down on the septum. It's actually mid-septal spot. And when we did the septogram, we were nice deep into the septum. Okay. So if I overlay this anatomy pictures, again, what am I capturing here? I think I'm not capturing the left bundle branch trunk. I'm very low on the septum, on the posterior aspect. Most likely capturing the left posterior fascicle. And when we tested this lead, this is VVI bipolar pacing, threshold testing at three walls. At three walls, you can see in V1, you have a nice narrow QS morphology. At 1.75 volts, you can see it transitions here from QS to RSR prime pattern. So this is bipolar pacing. So what's happening here is as you come down on the threshold, at some point, typically between 2 and 2.5 volts, you lose the anodal capture, you lose the ring capture, and you get pure left bundle branch pacing. So here you can see RSR prime pattern. And then the threshold was all the way down to 0.5 at 0.5 milliseconds. And note the axis. You have a left axis deviation. Again, in this case, we were so low in the mid septum, posterior septum, we were capturing the left posterior fascicle. Despite being so low on the septum, we were able to narrow the QRS down to below 120 milliseconds. And I think that's the big advantage because you have a wider landing zone. 